The two Zhangs were originally recruited by Sun Jian to be his advisors. Zhang Hong was a close friend of the Sun family, and served as Sun Jian's privy advisor whilst he was involved in his campaigns. Zhang Zhao was a calligrapher, essayist, military general and politician, who had a lot more recorded about his life. He started his career in his native Shu province, until the chaos caused him to flee south for shelter. Chen Shu appraised him. Zhang Zhao received a mission to assist Sun Chuan. His contributions were outstanding. He was loyal, outspoken and upright. His actions were not for his own interests. He was feared, however, because he was too stern, and so was also shunned by others because he liked to assume the moral high ground. He was given neither the role of Chancellor or an Imperial Tutor. Instead, he had a rather unimpressive career, and spent his old age in retirement. This shows that Sun Chuan was not as wise as Sun Si. In 208, he strongly advised Sun Chuan to surrender to Tao Tao, because he believed that they stood no chance against him in the coming invasion. His incorrect prediction on such a grave matter may have contributed to him being shunned by the other generals of Wu. It's likely he wanted to avoid warfare altogether for the betterment of the people, as by now, even Zhang Hong was in league with Tao Tao, although Hong did continue to display his loyalty towards Sun Chuan. Pei Songji argues that Zhang Zhao never intended to help Sun Su or Sun Chuan become rulers in their own right. All he desired was to assist them in bringing peace to the common people living under their control. He advised Chuan to surrender because he saw an opportunity to reunite the fragmented Han Empire under Tao Tao's control. Although Zhang Zhao may not be considered loyal towards Sun Chuan, he had the greater interests of the common people at heart. Zhang Hong was born in the year 153 and came from Guangling Commandery. Zhang Zhao was born three years later in the princedom of Pencheng State within Shu Province. As a youth, Zhao was recognised for always studying then became specialised in the clerical script style of Chinese writing. It's known for its wavy appearance and was incorrectly attributed to the Xin Dynasty clerks in the Book of Han, claiming the clerks adopted the new script to cope with the heavy workload. He studied the Spring and Autumn Annals and its corresponding commentary, the Zuo Zuan, under his tutor, Bo Hu Zian. He went on to be well versed in history and became close friends with two other well-known scholars, Xiao Ye and Wang Lang. When he reached adulthood at 19, he declined an offer to serve in the government, instead choosing to go with Wang Lang to compile an essay on the ancient use of taboo names. They were praised by Chen Lin and others for their work, which contradicted the arguments of Ying Xiao, another celebrated scholar from Runan who was a long-term associate of Tao Tao. Dao Xian felt insulted when he nominated Zhang Zhao into service, but he declined yet again. An order for his arrest was issued, but Zhao Ye, who was serving in Dao Xian's administration, was able to convince the governor to pardon him. In 172, Sun Jian put down a rebellion in Kua Ji, where after he was rewarded with an assistant magistrate role in Guangling and in two counties in Xi'a Pei. This allowed him to gather many followers until 184 when the Yellow Turban Rebellion broke out. This could have been the time that the two Zhangs were recruited by Sun Jian to be his advisors, and Zhang Hong served as his privy advisor during his campaigns. In the 190s, when chaos broke out and many people fled south to take shelter in Jing and Yang provinces, Zhang Zhao followed suit and moved from Pengcheng State to Jiangdong. Between 194 and 199, Sun Se conquered the Jiangdong territories. During this time, he had heard of Zhang Zhao's talents and successfully recruited him. Sun Se was delighted when he said, Now that I have expanded my domain in all the four corners, I should treat learned and virtuous men with the utmost respect. I won't treat you in any degrading manner. Zhang Zhao was honoured like a teacher, then appointed as a colonel. Sun Se paid his respects to Zhang Zhao's mother and treated him like an old friend. He was promoted to a general of the household and was often consulted on civil and military matters. Zhang Hong was often responsible for writing official memorials and essays to Emperor Zian and Tao Tao on Sun Se's behalf. At this time, Zhang Zhao received several flattering letters from his fellows in the north, so now he faced a dilemma on how to deal with them. On one hand, he was afraid to keep them a secret in case Sun Tzu discovered them and questioned his loyalty. On the other hand, he was worried that people would scorn him for being boastful if he revealed them. Sun Tzu eventually found out anyway and laughed. He acknowledged that Zhang Zhao's virtuous assistance towards him meant that their glory was one and the same, and so saw the matter as trivial. When Sun Tzu died, he entrusted Sun Chuan to Zhang Zhao's care and told him, If Xiong Mu turns out to be incompetent, you may replace him. If there's no way to overcome the difficulties, you can gradually retreat back west where you will have no worries. Zhang Zhao accepted his mission, then led all of Sun Tzu's former subjects to support the 18-year-old Sun Chuan and pledge their allegiance to him. 
Zhang Zhao then wrote to the Han central government, informing them of the new succession. Then he wrote to all the key appointment holders throughout Chuan's domain to continue performing their duties as before. Zhang Hong was sent to serve Tao Tao, who later sent him back to monitor Sun Chuan's activities, but Zhang Hong remained loyal to Sun until his death. Sun Chuan was so overwhelmed with grief over his brother's death that he spent his time in mourning instead of taking charge of the regime. Zhang Zhao urged him to inherit, expand, and bring greater glory to his brother's legacy. How can you remain in bed and occupy yourself with grief when you can't afford the luxury of time for such behaviour like any other person? He further warned Sun Chuan that he's blindly adhering to rights without realising he's actually leaving his gates wide open for the enemy to enter. Upon hearing this, Sun Chuan changed out of his morning attire, got onto horseback with Zhang Zhao's help, and inspected his troops as they assembled in formation. His new subjects accepted his leadership when they pledged themselves to him, then Chuan appointed Zhang Zhao as his chief clerk, and ordered him to perform the same duties as he did under Sun Tzu. The Xiangdong region was unstable, but with Zhang Zhao's assistance, Sun Chuan was able to consolidate control. Almost all the people were pacified and won over, whilst many great talents were recruited to serve in his administration. Whenever Sun Chuan went into battle, he left Zhang Zhao behind to guard his main base and oversee day-to-day -day affairs. On one occasion, Zhang Zhao suppressed an uprising by remnants of the Yellow Turban rebels. In the spring of 208, the newly recruited Gan Ning pointed out that Liu Biao was unable to defend his territory from Tao Tao, who would soon march on the region. He recommended that it would be better for Sun Chuan to seize Jing before Tao Tao could, and the first step of his plan was to attack the old-aged Wang Zhu at Jiangxia. This invasion would be the last part of a series of battles between Sun Chuan and Liu Biao. Zhang Zhao disagreed with the campaign, however, as he feared it would cause chaos as Wu had not yet been completely pacified. Gan Ning criticised how he can't even be confident that there wouldn't be chaos under his watch. With this, Sun Chuan ignored Zhang Zhao and put Gan Ning in charge of planning and leading the campaign. Wang Zhu was killed and they conquered Jiang Xia commandery. By late autumn of the same year, Tao Tao marched south and swiftly conquered Jing province. Sun Chuan summoned his fearful subjects for a meeting and showed them a threatening letter he received from Tao Tao, claiming that he had over 800,000 troops. In Zhang Zhao's and Qin Song's opinions, they could not win a battle against Tao Tao. Zhou Yu and Lu Su reinforced Sun Chuan's desire to go to war, and he privately told them he was deeply disappointed with Zhang Zhao, Qin Song and the others. Once his mind was made up, he drew his sword, slashed his table in front of him and said, Any of you who dares to speak of surrendering to Tao Tao shall end up like this table. After Liu Bei and Sun Chuan's decisive victory at Red Cliffs, Zhou Yu took control of Chuan's troops and attacked Jiang Ling. Sun Chuan personally led another army to attack Heifei, and ordered Zhang Zhao to assault Quan Chi, a fortress in Guangling. Sun Chuan and Zhang Zhao were unable to capture their targets, whilst Zhou Yu successfully conquered Jiang Ling. Bandits led by Zhou Feng rose up in Yuzhang Commandery, so Zhang Zhao was sent to lead Sun Chuan's army to defeat them. After this battle, Zhang rarely assumed military command again, as Sun Chuan decided to keep him by his side as a strategist and advisor. He was treated very respectfully because of his senior status in the administration. Zhang Hong passed away in 212 at the age of 59. On his deathbed, he petitioned Sun Chuan to develop the city of Mo Ling, which ultimately became the imperial capital of the state of Wu. Sun Chuan enjoyed going on hunting excursions for fun. When he was hunting on horseback with bow and arrows, a tiger suddenly attacked him and clawed at his saddle. When Zhang Xiao heard about it, he lectured him, General, why are you doing this? A leader of men should be one who has control and mastery over the heroes and talents serving under him. You shouldn't be riding freely in the wilderness and proving your courage by wrestling with wild beasts. If you get into an accident, wouldn't you become a laughingstock of the whole empire? Sun Chuan apologised for letting Zhang Zhao down, admitting fault due to his youth and lacking wisdom. Unwilling to give up on his favourite pastime, Sun Chuan designed a chariot for his hunting. It had squarish openings but no roof, and was accompanied by only one driver. Sun Chuan fired arrows at wild beasts through the openings. They encountered an unspecified animal, which left its pack or herd and came very close to the chariot. Sun Chuan got out and had fun wrestling in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the animal. When Zhang Zhao found out, he repeatedly urged Sun Chuan to stop engaging in dangerous activities, but the latter just laughed and ignored him. Almost a decade later, Sun Chuan pledged allegiance to the emperor of the newly established Wei, Tao Pi. Xing Zhen was sent to grant Sun Chuan the title King of Wu on the 23rd of September in 221. 
When he arrived at Wu Chang for the ceremony, he didn't dismount from his carriage when he reached the city gates. Zhang Zhao scolded him. Courtesy is essential in your decorum, just as enforcement is essential in law. Sir, how dare you behave so arrogantly? Do you really think that the people of Jiangnan are so weak and poor that we don't even have an inch of a blade? Xing Zhen immediately got off the carriage, then continued into the city on foot. After Sun Quan became King of Wu, Zhang Zhao received new appointments and a Marquis title. Along with Sun Shao, Tang Yin, Zheng Li and others, they drafted the rules of the Imperial Protocol for their kingdom, based on those of the Zhou and Han dynasties. On one occasion, Sun Quan was in Wu Chang making merry. He hosted a drinking party on a terrace and invited all his subjects to attend. The servants splashed water on everyone, after which Sun Quan joked, the party shall not end until everyone gets dead drunk. Zhang Zhao did not say anything, put on a stern face, then walked out of the party to sit inside his carriage alone. Chuan sent someone to ask him to come back, but he remained angry and refused. Chuan fell silent and looked embarrassed, then soon called off the party. When Chuan broke ties with Tao Pi and became emperor, he wanted to create the position of imperial chancellor in his government, so he looked for suitable candidates for the position. Despite Zhang Xiao's seniority and experience, he was passed over twice for the role, as Sun Quan thought he was too headstrong and stubborn to effectively lead the administration. Nevertheless, Chuan treated Zhang Xiao as a mentor-like figure throughout his formative years to his ascension to the throne. Many agreed that Zhang Xiao was best for the position, but Chuan argued that in times of chaos, key appointments are to be filled by persons capable of shouldering great responsibilities. He said they shouldn't be treated like honorary positions, and ultimately selected Shun Xiao to be the first Chancellor of Wu. Three years later, in 225, Sun Xiao passed away, so Zhang Xiao was nominated once more. Sun Quan refused once more and said, It's not that I'm being unkind towards Zibu by not choosing him. The person holding the position of Imperial Chancellor has to deal with so many issues on a daily basis. Zhang Zhao is too headstrong. If people don't listen to him, there'll be lots of conflicts. It won't be helpful at all. He then chose Gu Yong to be the second Chancellor of Wu. Sun Quan once told his subjects, I wouldn't have become emperor today if there wasn't Zhou Yu to assist me. Just as Zhang Zhao prepared to hold up his cup in congratulations, the emperor remarked, If I'd listened to Lord Zhang, I'd be begging for food today. Zhang felt deeply embarrassed as he broke out in a cold sweat and then sank to his knees. Rafter Krepny believes this record is probably false, because making such a public insult towards Zhang Zhao would not do Sun Quan any favours regarding his reputation and authority. In the summer of 229, Zhang Xiao retired from active service due to old age and poor health. He withdrew from his position and returned command of his troops to the Wu government. Sun Quan still gave him an honorary title as a general who assists Wu, which gave him a status just below the Three Excellencies, the collective name for the three highest official positions within Wu. He was also awarded with a Marquis state, consisting of 10,000 taxable households. He stayed at home and spent his time writing a guide to the commentary on the Spring and Autumn Annals and annotated a copy of the Analects of Confucius. Zhang Zhao's nephew, Zhang Fen, designed a war chariot to serve as a siege engine when he was only 19. Bu Zhi recognised his talent and recommended him to serve in the Wu army. Zhang Zhao disapproved, however, and told Fen, You are still young. Why do you want to put yourself through hardship by serving in the army? Fen replied that he may be untalented, but he's no longer young, then recited the story of Wang the boy, a hero boy who died fighting for the state of Lu. Zhang Fen steadily rose through the ranks to become a general, eventually becoming a fief as a Marquis. On one occasion, Sun Quan asked Yan Jun to speak something he'd remembered since childhood, so he recited the opening paragraph from the classics of filial piety. Zhang Zhao was present and remarked, Yan Jun is a mediocre scholar. I humbly ask to recite for your majesty as well. Zhang went on to recite the service of the head of state from the same classical text, which made the other subjects agree that Zhang Xiao had a good understanding of what he should recite in front of the emperor. By now, Zhang Xiao was well known for being very outspoken, forthright and blunt in his speech whilst at court. But after he openly defied orders from Sun Quan in front of the other officials, he was removed for some time. His attitude was soon missed however, as a boastful ambassador from Shu had arrived who sang praises of his kingdom in front of Sun Quan. Other officials tried to debate and challenge the ambassador but failed. Sun Quan sighed, if Lord Zhang were here, the Shu ambassador would feel intimidated before he could even debate us, much less boast about his state. The next day, Sun Quan sent a messenger to summon Zhang Zhao back to court. When he arrived, he refused to take a seat, then Chuan knelt down and begged him to stop. Zhang gave in, sat down and then told Sun Quan, 
In the past, Lady Wu and Sun Tzu didn't entrust me to serve you, they entrusted you onto me instead. That's why I've been trying so hard to fulfil my duty as a subject to them, by repaying the faith they placed in me. So future generations would have something praiseworthy to say about me after I die. I not only lack knowledge and wisdom, but also defied the will of your majesty. I expected to be left alone to die in a ditch, and never thought I'd be summoned back to serve in your court again. All I want to do is serve my state loyally until I die. If anybody says I've returned to service seeking glory and fame, then they are absolutely wrong, as this is something I would never do. Sun Quan then apologised and left. In 233, Gong Sun Yuan from Liao Dong rebelled against Wei and pledged allegiance to Wu. Sun Quan wanted to send Zhang Mi and Xu Yan to grant the title King of Yan onto Gong Sun, but Zhang Zhao strongly objected. Gong Sun Yuan isn't sincere about pledging allegiance to you. He needs aid from a distant ally because he's afraid that Wei will retaliate after he rebelled against them. If he decides to switch sides and surrender to Wei, the two representatives you sent to Liao Dong won't be able to return alive. If that happens, wouldn't you become a laughing stock? The pair got into a heated argument over this issue, which infuriated Sun Chuan. Zhang Zhao was adamant that he was right and stubbornly refused to give in, so Chuan lost his temper and placed his hand on his sword. When the people of Wu enter the palace, they pay respects to me. Outside the palace, they pay respects to you. My respect for you has already reached the maximum possible extent, yet you humiliate me in front of everyone. I'm really afraid that I'll lose control of myself and end up hurting you. Zhang Xiao stared at him in silence for some time before replying, although I know my advice won't always be heeded, I'll always try my best to fulfil my loyalty. The dying words of your mother still ring as clearly in my ears today as when I was beside her when she spoke to me in her final moments. Zhang Zhao had tears in his eyes, then broke down and cried. Sun Xuan dropped his sword and started crying too, but ultimately did not heed Zhang Zhao's advice. He felt so frustrated he refused to show up in court and stayed at home. That angry Sun Xuan ordered for the entrance of Zhang's residence to be sealed up by piling earth in front of it. Zhang Zhao doubled down and ordered his servants to pile up earth too, and blocked the entrance from the inside as well. By autumn of the same year, Gong Zun Yuan had betrayed Sun Quan and executed Zhang Mi and Xu Yan. Chuan realised he was in the wrong, so tried to apologise several times to Zhang Zhao, but the latter ignored him and claimed to be sick. Chuan then set fire to the entrance, but only to scare Zhang Zhao into coming out. Zhang not only continued to refuse, but also locked shut all of his windows and doors, so Chuan's plan backfired. He had no choice but to put the fires out, then he stood waiting at the entrance for some time. Zhang Zhao's sons helped their father out, while Sun Quan left, then agreed to arrange for a carriage to come back to fetch Zhang. At the palace, Chuan apologised profusely to Zhang, who finally forgave him and returned to work. Zi Zuo Qi praised Sun Quan for acknowledging his mistakes and doing his best to show remorse. He also criticised Zhang Zhao for his pompous and condescending attitude. As a subject to a ruler, he should know his place and refrain from pushing things to such an extreme even if he was right. Throughout his life, Zhang Zhao was known for maintaining a dignified and solemn appearance, and for having an awe-inspiring bearing. His colleagues saw him as an intimidating figure. Sun Quan once said, When I speak to Lord Zhang, I don't dare say anything in jest. Zhang Zhao passed away at age 81 in the year 236. He left instructions that he wanted a coffin of simple design, and to be dressed in plain clothes. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you next time.